Good afternoon, everyone. We're, we're about to start. Uh, my name is Alfredo Gonzalez, and I am the coordinator of the reproduction of race and racial ideology workshop. Thank you all for coming. I want to thank a few people from the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, uh, Tracy Matthews, uh, Dara Edison, and Julius Jones for uh, helping put this event together today. Uh, you know, this is the second workshop of the quarter, uh, focusing on race and capitalism, which is curated by Professor Michael Dawson. Today we have two prominent figures in the study of race and politics. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our very own director, Professor Michael Dawson. Uh, Professor Dawson is a John D. MacArthur Professor of Political Science and the College at the University of Chicago. Uh, some of Professor Dawson's publications include uh, Blacks in and out of the left, it's not in our lifetime, the future of black politics, black visions, and of course, behind the women, uh, race, race and class in African American politics. Uh, today, Professor Dawson will be presenting his article entitled uh, Hidden in Plain Sight, the Note on Legitimation, uh, Legitimation Crisis and the Racial Order. Uh, joining Professor Dawson in this rich and important uh, discussion is Professor Charles Mills. Uh, Professor Mills is a John Evans Professor of More and Intellectual Philosophy at Northwestern University. And some of Professor Mills' publications include Radical Theory, Caribbean Reality, uh, Race, Class, and Social Domination, uh, Contract and Domination with Carol Payton, and of course, The Rich of Contract. Uh, you don't have the racial contract. You just got to go In an hour and a half. <laughs> uh, today, Professor Mills is going to share his thoughts around a piece that he re recently published in Descent Magazine uh, entitled Breaking the Racial Contract. Uh, I want to say that uh, we invited Professor Mills two weeks ago, and you know he graciously said, I'll be there. So, um, no, first he said, how much? <laughs> <laughs> not worth the contract. Not. <laughs> so uh, please help me in welcoming our, our presenters today. Usually what I use for props are numbers, um, but not today. Uh, so I just have to be stick with a PowerPoint and still pretend I'm a student of American politics. Uh, some of my colleagues in the country think that I've been up on road and I'm doing other things these days. Uh, so it's not surprising. My, my background originally, as some of you know, was first as an activist and then for many, many years a uh, scholar of black studies a student of black studies and eventually a scholar of race, ethnicity, and politics. <coughs> and this work comes out conversations I've had with many colleagues and friends about the current crisis in blacks and other communities of color. <coughs> it also flows out my work with Megan Francis on black politics and the neoliberal racial order and changes that have occurred since the age of Jim Crow <coughs> in politics, the American political economy, and our racialized civil society. <coughs> I can only sketch the bare bones of the argument in a lot of time. Alfredo, uh, don't be gentle when it's time to cut me off. <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, hopefully the paper provide, which is available on our website, uh, provides a fuller and more convincing cut than I can provide today. The anger that fuels a protest from Ferguson to Baltimore, from New York City to Detroit, <coughs> still boils in black communities throughout. Okay, we have a problem. Never use somebody else's computer. I don't want any props today. Um, the English, uh, boils in black communities throughout the United States. It's 
This is natural as the underlying conditions of economic depression and depression remain relatively unchanged. Some of this anger has been channeling through new grassroots black movements that are once again led primarily by young people, such as those of the Black Lives Matters movement. In the wake of the cycle of the latest racist outrages, such as the Charleston massacre, followed by the rage, despair, and protest, a reasonable question to ask, the one asked by Martin Luther King Jr. in 1967, is where do we go from here? A question that was asked earlier in the 20th century, what is to be done? In the wake of racial violence perpetuated by both the state and individuals steeped in the racism endemic of American civil society, New black movements have focused on questions of criminal justice, attacks on black lives and bodies, mass incarceration, and the like. These foci, of course, make per perfect sense in the current climate. Yet some have argued that the Occupy Wall Street movement of a few years ago, the scholarship of Thomas Piketty, combined with a closer look at the, under at the lo underlying logics of systemic black economic subordination, in cities such as Baltimore, suggest that we need to focus more intensely on the deep economic inequality that particularly plagues black communities while simultaneously and massively corrupting whatever semblance of representative democracy remains. The urgency of this question is heightened by a pervasive sense, particularly but not exclusively within communities of color, a perpetual and rapidly escalating crisis. The answer we would have got from the activists of the black radical movement of the 20th century, especially the, from the black power movement, would have been to focus simultaneously on both. From Malcolm X to the Black Panthers, from the Detroit Revolutionary <coughs> Union movement to the myriad of small regional and local groups of the 1970s black liberation movement, they all focused on both the attack on black bodies and the ravages of super exploitation that was a result of racialized capitalist expropriation and exploitation. These groups span a relatively wide ideological spectrum. Some, um, relatively few, but some consider themselves liberals. Others, nationalists, and many call themselves black Marxists, are often a combination of Marxism and nationalism. Yet, while that may have been the common sense answer for the last century, there are two questions that you kind of answer in these times. One question is whether their answer is still relevant today. And so, what is the relationship between the oppression of black bodies and the systematic economic exploitation and expropriation of black communities. Another way of framing this first question is, what is the relationship between race and this new stage of neoliberal capitalism in the 21st century? The second question is closely related to the first. To what degree can we characterize the period that we live in as one of crisis, and if so, what is the nature of that crisis? I argue that the U.S. is experiencing a deep crisis, a legitimation crisis, as defined by Jurgen Habermas and discussed by Nancy Fraser in a recent article. Further, we cannot understand this crisis, which is deeply sitting in multiple parts of the populations, without understanding the current and historical nature of the relationship between the race and capitalism in the United States. Indeed, the current crisis of legitimacy within the U.S., I argue, is due in no small, small part to the increasing problematic intersection of racial domination, patriarchy, and capitalist exploitation. The log logic of racial expropriation is critical for fully understanding the current crisis. Disruption in one domain, such as that of the racial order, can lead to disruption in one or more other domains, such as that of the capitalist social order. These disruptions can undermine the state's legitimacy and move the system toward crisis. Habermas identified a key task of the state when he argued, quote, after the capitalist mode of production has been established, the exercise of the state's power within the social system can be limited to the shielding of market mechanisms from self-destructive side effects." Unquote. The state, however, has multiple shielding tasks, as the logics of white supremacy and patriarchy also have to be mediated so that the capitalist economy can function as efficiently as possible. These logics can conflict, and for example, a substantial portion of the population believes that the state is undermining its traditional support for a white supremacist order, then the state will be perceived as increasingly illegitimate and can rapidly enter a crisis. It's a, it is apparent to some when we observe the rise of racial strife in the U.S. during this period 
and ethno-religious conflict in Europe that racial and ethnic lodges are generating a deep and perhaps even more dangerous crisis than those of capital, reproduction, ecology, or politics. These crises, as well as those discussed by Frazier and Habermas, are capable of generating a full-fledged climate crisis of legitimacy. They have already done so, or perhaps they re reawakened such a crisis in poor black communities where we observe the emergence of movements that are increasingly suspicious, justly I would argue, of the neoliberal privilege that black elites and their organizations have sometimes <coughs> and substantially eagerly embraced. Nancy Fraser has a trenchant and convincing analysis of both modern capitalism and the nature of the contemporary crisis in two articles. In her new Left Review article, Behind Marxist Hidden Abode, on Expanded Conception of Capitalism from 2014, she gives us her account of the nature of modern capitalism. <coughs> she asks the question, what sort of animal is capitalism? She argues that it's something larger than an economy, and she says, thus, if capitalism is not an economic system, what is it? My answer is that it's best conceived as an institutionalized social order on par with, for example, feelings of uncle. Frazier's task then is to delineate and analyze what she calls the background condition, quote, the hidden abodes, unquote, that enable capitalist society. She argues for the central role of reproduction to capitalism and analyzes how neoliberalism transforms social reproduction, therefore the relationship between patriarchy and capitalism. In addition to the bold of reproduction, she identifies the ecology and the political and background domains necessary for capitalist society to function. In turn, she maps each respectively onto the binaries of production reproduction, human non-human, and the economy and the political. All these background domains, according to Fraser, are not only necessary for the functioning of capitalism, but also integral to the capitalist system itself, and each has its own logics or potential such sources of friction and resistance. Frazier also implicitly identifies expropriation as another that hit it in both, and she states, quote, but it turns out there's a whole backstory about where capitalist self comes from. A rather violent story of dispossession and expropriation. <coughs> Unquote. So what, what strangely Frazier does not develop the analysis on one of the critical domains of the function of capitalism, even though she identifies as one that is necessary both to the foundation and continued function of capitalism. As Frazier and Marx both note, Capitalism was founded on ex violent expropriation, theft, and murder, or to use historians Quinn Becker's phrase, <coughs> more capitalism. Understanding the foundation of capitalism requires a consideration of what I call the hidden abode of race, the ontological distinction between superior and inferior humans, codified as race, that was necessary for slavery, colonialism, the theft of lands and Americans and Jewish people. <coughs> this racial separation <coughs> is manifest in the division between full humans who possess the right to sell their, their labor and compete within markets, and those who are disposable, discriminated against, and ultimately either eliminated or super exploited. These are the background conditions that produce and continue to produce the boundary struggles against racialized expropriation. These struggles are found in Ferguson, Baltimore, and elsewhere as the ongoing processes of expropriation, super exploitation, exclusion, genocide, and disposal continue to wreak havoc in communities of color within the U.S. I further argue that the associated binary, well, I just label it between superior and inferior humans, has different instantiations. In some places, this binary is framed as human, subhuman, in other, full citizen, second class citizen, or sometimes civilized, uncivilized. In each case, the division is marked a racialized group whose labor, properties, and bodies could be subject to expropriation, exploitation, and violation without recourse to particularly civic and political resources available to those classified as fully human. These expropriations enable the launching of the Industrial Revolution and the growth of both the United Kingdom and the United States as hegemonic economic powers. Owner insists, and I'm probably mispronouncing his name, I apologize, <coughs> reconceptualization of the inception of capitalism helps us better understand the relationship between capitalism and racialization. He forcefully argued that we should replace the centering of the nation state at the, at the birth of capitalism, the concept of colonial empire. Further, he argues, quote, the crucial corollary of colonial perspective on capitalism is a heavy emphasis. You're <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
it, it, it is a, it's, it's, it's a heavy emphasis on the role of institutional military force in effectuating authoritative political order in the space. This they also analyzes the othering of populations whose bodies, land, and labor are expropriated within a system of racialized capitalism. He argues that force was necessary to control those populations. They were, quote, situated beyond the line. The colony represented the vote of the savage and the barbarian peoples, unquote. Inslee's research <coughs> demonstrates that from the beginning, there were multiple logics contained within global capitalism, and the colonial-based logics of racialized expropriation affected all parts of the world, not the least of which was the United States. So, in part of the paper, in the next part of the slides, I was going to, to uh, mm -hmm. talk about, <laughs> I talk about how this system is, was extended into the period of the 20th century through Jim Crow, through segment in labor markets, through um, other types of <coughs> regionalization of capitalism, and into the current period, um, where the relationship between uh, communities of color and labor markets and capitalism has changed substantially, but I think I'll jump directly at this point to the conclusion and I'll let the discussion and question and answer help with the further um, exposition of the argument. <coughs> so the 20th century black Chicano, I'm moving on to the discussion of, of the current legitimation crisis, at least in how I see it. The 20th century black Chicano and women's struggles was fairly successful in extending formal citizenship rights to members of subordinate groups. Although these rights are <coughs> violated in practice. They also had some success in winning programs on government redistribution, such as Medicaid, as well as opening up the occupational structure to allow the fuller, if not full, participation in the groups and occupational sectors of the economy from which they have been previously gained. These modest successes led in part to capitalist crisis of the 1970s and the general repression of, of Western economies. A neoliberal onslaught resulted in the hugely successful effort to reverse the victories of marginalized groups and workers in the country such as the U.S. The combination of the partial successes of these movements, including the perceived change in status of previously privileged sectors of workers, and the partial withdrawal of resources that came with the national liberation and anti-colonial struggles of the 20th century, meant a somewhat reduced capacity for even the limited class compromises of the past. Capital no longer tried to support both growing returns to capitalism and capitalists, and by today's standards, it generates class compromise. The end of this compromise undermined the legitimacy of the U.S. order within particularly, <coughs> for, and for one of the first times in modern history, the white middle and previously privileged sectors of the white working class. The loss of the legitimacy among people of color and the loss of status and legitimacy among many whites are in deep contradiction to each other. These groups are both affected by different degrees by the ec economic precarity generated by today's capitalist order, but the loss of the legitimacy is also tied to both groups but for, different, for very different reasons for the racial order. In conclusion, <laughs> <laughs> we must recognize that only by understanding simultaneously the intersections of logics of capitalism and white supremacy, and in the paper I add, I add patriarchy as well, mm -hmm. can we hope to forge an analytical framework that can, might guide it provide a guide for understanding combating the multiple logics that have devastated black and other communities they don't get categorized and treated as less than fully human. That is, who have rights less than those of full citizens. This is a context in which, which movements such as the Black Lives Matter <coughs> organize and fight. Given the evolution of racialized capitalism, they and we have no choice but to simultaneously fight white supremacy and economic injustice. We must insist on the full human rights for Sandra Black Blonde and her fellow victims of racist and murderous state, as well as the victims of terrorists such as Dylan Roof. We must fight new modes of state expropriation that seek to recover revenue for capitalists in the state by violating the most basic of human rights, such as the shutting off of water to poor families in Detroit, the use of the police in <coughs> communities such as Ferguson to extract unconstitutional revenues from black, quote unquote, citizens, or the state enable use of tax liens in cities such as Chicago to enable entrepreneurial thieves to legally steal the property of people of color. In the U.S., part of the power of white supremacy is that we often overlook the importance of analyzing its logics when we fight for justice, even though, even though the abode of race is hidden in plain sight. Thank you.
I think you would comment on it. No, I don't. They're going to comment no. afterwards. Okay, so people will forgive me a brief plug for another event. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sort of outreach, a uh, series of outreach talks um, held at the seminary core. Uh, the next, uh, first one, uh, perhaps, uh, the next Thursday, October 29th at 6 p.m. Theme being Bernie Sanders and Black Lives Matter. And I will speak on that one So if you're not out of the sick of me after this one, <laughs> you might consider coming to that one. Okay, now as alarm to hear Michael use the term ontological, because I mean, that's a philosophy term. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to have the franchise on that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll steal from anybody. Like, oh, yeah, I don't know what we're going to have left. Anyway, so um, as you'd expect, I'm very much on the same page as Michael. I mean, you know, um, most of the points he's making, though, um, of course, from a more abstract perspective of philosophy. You know, philosophers like to sort of float in an air way above stuff and not get their hands dirty with stuff. <laughs> but I also um, came from an activist tradition, very distant, safely confined to graduate school in my case. Um, from the stage, you know, that you have to sort of graduate and sort of get on with your life. So I also started off um, in the Marxist tradition and trying to sort of make sense of the world through the Marxist tradition. Because, of course, Marxism was, for many years, as you know, the most important body of oppositional theory within the Western tradition. And um, the pride of Marxism was that whereas liberalism confined itself to analysis in terms of things like culture and ideas and values, Marxism went to sort of heart of things, which was in a socioeconomic structure. And the Marxist claim was that it was more illuminating to take a materialist approach to these matters and to look at you know, the social and political and the ideological and cultural in relation to economic structures. And the crucial claim was that the liberal boast of equality was sort of demarcated you know, the um, emerging politics <coughs> of modernity as against the sort of pre-modern um, sort of feudal order was the moral equality of individuals. So you know, we have sort of famous slogans, French Revolution, we have a Jefferson statement in the Declaration, we hold these truths of self-evident all men are created equal. And the Marxist critique was that this equality, this sort of moral equality, this equality that you have at the level of exchange, is undercut by compulsion at the level of relations of production. But the claim of equality is not itself being challenged. The idea is you do have normative equality. That is what sort of demarcates the transition from the pre-modern to the modern epoch, where this equality of everybody is undercut by sort of material factors, so that in effect, you know, the sort of privileged class, the capitalist class, they have sort of more freedom, more equality than others. And the problem with this analysis is that it's very much an analysis centered on the experience of the white population. And the crucial point, of course, that um, people of color made over the decades, over the centuries, is that people of color do not even achieve normative equality. So you know, they are, of course, additionally handicapped you know, by the fact of you know, being in the subordinated classes. But independent <coughs> of that, there's a failure to achieve that level of sort of moral equality that the white working class attains. It's sort of you know, famous encapsulated, and for those of you who haven't read any of these, you certainly should. Jean-Paul Sartre's introduction to Fanon's Wretched of the Earth, and he has this famous line, across the ocean, there's a race of less than humans. Um, there's nothing more consistent than a racist humanism. Across the ocean, there's a race of less than humans. So that liberalism is not merely liberalism in a bourgeois sense, in that sort of, you know, um, talking about freedom and equality for everybody, and ignoring the class structures of working capitalists. It's also a liberalism that's racial in the sense that people of color do not even achieve the moral level of equality. So it then means that in trying to understand the workings of capitalism, in trying to sort of understand where race fits within capitalism, you can't just work with an orthodox left framework. And there's a sort of long history of people of color having deep problems you know, with the white left. Um, in the, um, sort of, you know, some classic names, um, people joined what was then called the African Blood Brotherhood in the sort of early 1920s, and the sort of experience of sort of fighting with the white left and saying that you need to understand race in a way different than you guys are doing. So the tendency was, and you could recognize racism or white chauvinism, as sometimes called in um, communist party circles, for example, 
but there's generally a failure to recognize white supremacy as a system itself. You can see this even in Marx. Um, he has this famous line in Capital, you know, of quoted that in the rose the dawn of capitalist production is based on Amerindian expropriation, it's based on African slavery. But this is not integrated into a sort of, you know, rethinking of you know what is claiming to be the logic of capitalism. But even capitalism, he was describing the capitalism of Europe. It's still the case that race makes a difference in terms of the relation between the English and the Irish, and also in a sort of relation of you know, um, European capital and the rest of the world. But this becomes especially salient, of course, in the capitalism of the European settler states. The Anglo settler states, such as the United States, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, and the Iberian settler states in the states of um, Latin America. So even if in all these societies, you know, you eventually have a capitalism of sorts, it's a capitalism that is sort of deeply structured by race, racial advantage, racial disadvantage, and you cannot then conceptualize it in these capitals that are just imported from Europe across the Atlantic. And there's a history, long history of, you know, people dropping out, um, Richard Wright, a member of the American Communist Party, and um, later as a white, I tried to be a communist, um, in a Césaire, you know, the PCF, French Communist Party, um, George Padmore, sort of an international figure in the sort of Marxist left, you know, drops out and writes pan Africanism or communism. And in each case, I suggest, I mean, there are also other factors in terms of um, the extent to which you, know, you have these parties linked to the sort of particular um, needs of Moscow at any particular moment, so that you have know, sort of in a strategic taken off of this and then dropped off of this so that in East of the Black struggle, for example, you know, when it's convenient, you take them up when other times it's not convenient, you drop them. You can find this, for example, in, um, in um, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, and in a sort of what happens there in terms of the brotherhood, and in sort of the um, black people struggling there. You can find it in a book like Arthur Kessler's Darkness at Noon, where he talks about, um, you know, that Adam he, the party activist, has to explain to people that he was in France or Belgium, okay, you know, we're going to sort of break in the sanctions on Ethiopia, and you have to understand it in a sort of revolutionary cause, and yet people in the cell don't understand that he's basically asking them to strike breakers. So this long and happy history, and I suggest that it's sort of intimately linked with this sort of failure to appreciate racial domination as a system in itself. So the phrase Michael used, in fact, for example, in um, pioneering works like Cedric Robbins' Black Marxism, the idea that we need to talk about white supremacist capitalism, racial capitalism, and we need to sort of work on the complexity of these two systems, or in a sense, as badly phrased, one interlocking system. And of course, as Michael points out, gender is part of it as well. So you have the Combahee River Collective, many decades later, saying it's a multiple set of oppression. So that intersectionality should then issue from the start. And you do find people, uh, names less well known today, people like um, Hubert Harrison, uh, people like Claudia Jones, and they're trying to bring together all these different elements. Okay, so what does this mean in terms of, how much time do I have? Six minutes, okay, all right. So what does it mean? Well, one of the things it means is that you need to recognize that exploitation takes place far more broadly than at the point of production. So you know, the classic analysis of exploitation is um, you know, the white working class, and it's you know, exploitation in terms of surface value and so forth. But once you sort of take the focus, focus of the white proletariat, once you, know, you look at people of color in general, you can then see that exploitation is taking place throughout the economy, because you have to see things like Native American expropriation, the exploitation, you have to see obviously slavery as exploitation, you have to see the, the, the denial of equal chances to work, the blacks and the privilege of white workers, you have to talk about what happens in ghettos, in terms of um, inferior products, you know, being charged sort of high prices, in terms of services, in terms of rent. So export, in a sense, you know, the Marxist cause of exploitation, once you sort of recognize the multidimensionality of all these, these arm facts, you then realize that you know, the exploitation that the white left has focused on is really just a sort of small part of the overall thing. And once you sort of recognize the sort of multidimensional system, you are then enabled to see that it's not just a matter of you know, capitalists versus workers, it's a white supremacist system in which the white working class is certainly exploited in a certain sense, but in addition, they're the beneficiaries <coughs> of racial exploitation. So moving very quickly to you know, my first book and my most successful, The Racial Contract, I was trying to sort of capture 
within the sort of you know, classic apparatus of liberal theory, social contract theory, which was hugely influential in 1650 to 1800, and then revived you know, by John Rawls. This idea of the need to understand society and the sort of deep embeddedness of race in sort of modern Western societies, and the extent to which liberalism has based the sort of you know, failed technologies. And I'm writing words about Jennifer Pitts, you know, Jennifer's work. Um, in sort of the rise after 1800 when people liberalism that's imperial. We've had um, feminist theories talking about liberalism that's patriarchal. And I've argued that in sort of you know, taking account of you know, the sort of relation of, of um, sort of Western liberalism to the rest of the world and also within individual countries, a liberalism that's racialized. So that insofar as social contract theory is both sort of capture, sort of workings of liberalism, you know, that everybody sort of gets together forms of society, and you know, everybody's regarded as a more equal, and then in the role of the government is sort of safeguard everybody's interests. That's great as an ideal, but in terms of the reality, we need to recognize, and here I'm following Carol Pakeman's sexual contract, that the actual reality is the contract is really a contract among the socially privileged. So it's a contract of race, and it means then that the people of color are not recognized as equal. So the sort of deep embeddedness of racialization in liberal political philosophy inheres in the fact that, and I say this guy sort of stole my ontological line, <laughs> is that people of color are not seen as ontological equals. And this, of course, is you know, right there in Jefferson's, in the Lord's Truth of Self Evident, because he's a slave owner where he's saying this stuff. So there's no contradiction. So there are these um, different positions on the sort of how you see race in relation to American political culture. There's um, what's called sort of a normally view, where it's um, racism and the contradiction to it. There's Roger Smith's more traditions view, where there's um, liberalism and there's racism. But the position you find in the black radical tradition, I think that's the correct one. And that position is that there's a symbiotic relationship, in the sense that liberalism is shaped by race, at least in its dominant forms. Um, the work, 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 work of emphasis, you also have to take account of you know, the oppositional anti-race and anti-imperialist forces. But the dominant form of liberalism, the racialized one, you can see that in sort of classic liberal theorists, um, John Locke, Immanuel Kant, George Hegel, and so forth. So a racial contract is basically the contract that has, in fact, sort of shaped in you know, the modern Western world. And the title of my piece, Breaking the Racial Contract, is suggesting that you might have the potentiality to know, insofar as we're now in a situation where even the whites have historically been privileged by this contract. You know, it's now the case that in a sort of period of you know, um, the union busting, you know, in our sort of record lows, 11% or so of the population um, sort of unionized, in terms of pensions drying up, in terms of opportunity structures sort of increasing its advantage of those at the bottom, you'd now be in a situation where the deal that, in effect, white Americans made in sort of hundreds of years ago that deal is no longer as beneficial as it once was. So there is a potentiality, I'm suggesting, of a transracial movement that's going to sort of involve the breaking of the racial contract, going to require the breaking of the racial contract. But the crucial ops that has to be taken into account, and again sort of goes back to the mistake the white left has historically made in terms of thinking it's just a matter of appeal to economic interests, they're also perceived racial interests. And those racial interests include the sense of white superiority, the sense that you're a superior being, so that racial equality, even if it might be more beneficial for you in sort of straight economic terms, there are other metrics of benefit as well. And if, you know, if it's important to you to feel yourself as part of the superior race, if that's going to be jeopardized by such a transracial lens, then you can have people basically not wanting to get involved in that. So this is not a struggle that you can, can be won just by straight economic appeal. It's going to require basically a white rethinking of identity, a white sort of rethinking of your sense of self, and that's going to require, as I in sort of in closing notes of the essay, it's going to require basically that you tell the truth. We tell the truth about the history of race and race in the United States, which is that it's historically a racial polity. It's founded on racial exploitation, and racial injustice has been central to its creation. And that racial injustice has permeated white identities. And this is something that we're going to have to confront before we can actually get these transracial lives. Yeah.
respondents brought up, and then we'll open it up to the Q&A. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my friends and colleagues, uh, Ashley Campy and Dr. Ainsley Lejeune. Uh, Dr. Lejeune uh, is a collegiate assistant professor with the Social Science Core uh, Power Identity and Resistance Cluster. Uh, her book manuscript is entitled Making Racism Visible in the World, uh, Achieving Racial Justice Through Political Resistance. Uh, and she'll be responding to Professor Mills. Uh, responding to Professor Dawson is Ashley Campy, who is a doctoral candidate in the Department of Political Science. Her, dis her dissertation focuses on the politicization of, of the family in late 20th century US politics and seeks to show how normative ideas of, of family life shape contemporary political and economic discourse. Uh, please join me in welcome. Thank you. And we're going to start with uh, Ashley. Great. Thank you very much for um, allowing me to participate in this conversation. Um, so, following the tradition of the Black Power Movement, Dawson confronts the present moment, which he describes as a moment of crisis, by insisting on the relationship between, quote, the attack on black lives and the ravages of super exploitation that is the result of racialized capitalist expropriation and exploitation, unquote. So my comments unpack your depiction of the relationship between white supremacy and capitalism, expro um, focusing in particular on your argument for the two-ness of slavery and work, expropriation, and exploitation. I will, success, I will suggest that this argument, which I take to be the central argument of your paper, um, is more forceful when delinked from Fraser's notion of crisis. So first then, Fraser's notion of legitimation crisis. A capitalist social order is an economic order built on supporting systems, what Fraser calls background conditions of political institutions, a social system of reproduction, and a natural resource ecology. When the political organization of public power into government, or the integration of people into families to reproduce society, cease to ensure that people integrate into the social order, and thus cease to sufficiently provide the basis of economic reproduction, we have a legitimation crisis. Generally, a crisis threatens when the capitalist order as is, quoting Fraser, decreasingly capable of solving citizens' problems or meeting their needs, unquote. For example, when a mass strike cannot efficiently be channeled into political negotiation, or when citizens in Ferguson stay out in protest day after day, only to be turned back by the use of emergency state powers and suspension of civil rights, crisis threatens. The logic of Fraser's argument is a logic of reigning in capitalism. The predatory, inflationary mechanisms of financialized capitalism are bad for capitalism understood as a social order, as Fraser does. They undermine regulation to such an extent that credit markets and contracts can't be trusted. They prey on inner city, the inner city poor to such an extent that, that, these that it inhibits their ability to continue to engage in consumption or prompts them to protest. I don't think that, the logic, that this logic can capture the complex social wor worlds in which black bodies are both integrated and exploited as workers, and expropriated and expelled as criminals. I think that you are, ar that you are arguing that white supremacy involves both of these relations, and that both have shaped the development of capitalist relations. My comments then are meant to prompt you to talk more about this. Early in your paper, you ask why Fraser is not more attentive to the historic and ongoing constitutive role of the expropriation of black bodies and wealth to the capitalist order, the problem of expropriation. It seems to me that the very idea that capitalism in the US functions through ongoing forms of expropriation and violence pushes against the idea of a friendly capitalist normal, which the, no which the notion of legitimation crisis depends. The notion of legitimation crisis needs to pull apart the exploitative dimension of capitalist orders from the expropriative dimension. It is based on the inexplicit assumption that if exploitation is kept within check, then the system functions to the benefit of all, so there can be legitimacy. The notion that expropriation is ongoing and constitutive, as I see you arguing here, puts exploitation in a different light. Exploitation at the levels it has reached in the contemporary economy depends on ongoing expropriation, 
that works to terrorize, impoverish, and otherwise quell the, the agency of potential workers so that they accept exploitation. You, you point to examples of this expropri expropriation. State-sanctioned foreclosures, the moment where credit and loan practices, normal for forms of exploitation, tip over to become forms of expropriation, the practice of predatory policing and fines as a form of revenue, the failure to invest in city services in black neighborhoods. Your analysis of white supremacy, as I understand it, points in a different direction than notions of legitimation crisis, which denies the normalcy of ongoing expropriation and violence. You show how the capitalist order can retain legitimacy while engaging in ongoing expropriation. And you argue convincingly that this um, can only be explained by white supremacy. Um, but would you agree that white supremacist ideologies um, that legitimize exploitation pose a distinct challenge, which Fraser also overlooks? Take, for example, the rebranding in the late 60s of the overt white supremacist Jim Crow order as a racially neutral moral order waging a war on drugs and welfare in the name, um, in, in defense of the patriarchal family. It seems to me that black movements today are successfully re revealing the expropriative violence of this order. Combating mass incarceration and predatory policing are now political priorities. But have we revealed the exploitation of precarious, low-wage labor, inadequate schooling and extortionary student loans, and the lack of basic state services that is the condition of integration into the capitalist normal? for many and dis dispro disproportionately for black people in the US. The ideology of moral reform and personal responsibility often works to erase and legitimize these ordinary forms of this, these ordinary capitalist conditions and that is part of white supremacy. Your picture of racialized expropriation as a background condition for capitalism following Fraser seems to suggest that crisis will come about systemically from the unsustainability of this order. But if this two-ness of the black condition of slave and worker are both part of white supremacist capitalism, not as you sometimes seem to suggest white supremacy as slavery on the one hand and capitalism as exploitation on the other, then I would want to highlight the political project necessary to link these two together, to link the violence of police terror to the violence of grueling social precarity. Perhaps the present appears as a crisis not because of some complex, multi-systemic unsustainability, but simply because at a time of acute violence, groups such as the Black Lives Matter movement have worked to make this link visible. So my questions then are to ask you to speak a little more about, I guess is to ask to answer my um, uh, direct challenge, which is do you, do you see that there's a way in which your diagnosis of white supremacy rather than radicalizing Fraser's um, diagnosis of legitimation crisis, perhaps points, uh, perhaps works against the logic of legitimation crisis um, uh, in the way that she, that she has laid it out. Okay, um, so thank you so much for these papers. Um, to the arguments that they make, the general arguments they make, I have to say amen. <laughs> I, I totally am, uh, agree. Um, but what, what exactly do I agree with? What do I want to pull out from here? Um, so both of the works we read for the workshop today make the case effectively and persuasively that the categories of race and class, the systems of white supremacy and capitalism are inextricably linked. Or in other words, to adequately understand class inequality, one must get a clear view of the role of race. And to understand racial inequality, one must get a clear view or injustice overall. One must get a clear view of the workings of the economy. Um, so in rough summary of like, taking different elements of what um, Mill said during his talk and then parts of um, Michael's paper, or Dawson's paper, um, you might say, <laughs> well, I said Mill, then I said Michael. <laughs> um, so the racially privileged in a, so roughly the stabilization of capitalism in the United States is premised upon there being a racially privileged class that's also socially and economically privileged, right? Um, and so that's the ways in which white supremacy are implicated in sort of like this economic political system um, of privilege. 
and it's, a, it's especially against the backdrop of racial exploitation that's happening abroad that this racial, this sort of social privileging is even possible, right? Um, and due to the movements of the 60s and 70s, we see racial exploitation not being possible on the levels that they were before, which then have sort of produced this economic crisis, right? A moment for where the racially privileged, due to their social privilege, have lost their social privilege. And with that, now their sort of racial privilege is in um, danger, right? Which then is something that they must reckon with, right? Um, so that's kind of like the intersectional story that I can sort of weave together very roughly from those, from the two papers taken together. Um, so Mills addresses the claim that electability legitimately takes race off the table as a distinct political concern and issue because the explicit mention of race means that one won't be electable. So if you are someone who care about race, then you ought to you ought to sort of accept those who may be sympathetic to race and sort of may uh, implicitly signal that kind of implicit support, but you should not sort of look for them to explicitly sort of address it because that would undermine your own interest in actually having it potentially addressed. Um, but the problem there that I think um, Mills sort of captures with this following quote, right, he writes, as we enter the new gilded age, as our planet hurdles toward catastrophe, and as the Koch brothers prepare to unleash their billions, it is the mistaken belief that we can effectively challenge plutocracy without addressing both racial and class injustice together. That is the, I mean, inequalities together. That is the real fantasy. So the idea that one could not sort of like explicitly thematize race and then somehow challenge problems that are implicated in race and sort of white class issues um, and the sort of complicated story about the way that race, white supremacy, racism are um, sort of implicated in um, capitalism don't even get told and aired or even sort of acknowledged as politically distinct problems in themselves, right? Um, so then we, to think about the recalcitrance of whites, the left, and bringing up race. Um, and what this reveals to us about then um, the intersection between racial and class injustices, especially with regard to how the economic crisis is perceived. So working class whites could see their fate bound up in the fates of all the working class, a kind of working class linked fate, but we know that this does not happen, why? Well, the decline of the white working class is often perceived as a result of the increasing status of racial minorities and the declining status of whites' illegitimacy. I mean, illegitimately. So what would it take to get whites to see in terms of class solidarity? And this is something that um, Mill points to throughout his work. I mean, education, sort of getting whites to dispel of their sense of social superiority. Um, and this being the thing that would be the important instrument to challenge white supremacy, right? Which then brings me to um, Dawson's paper about legitimacy. So he's saying that, or it makes me want to ask about the crisis of legitimacy. So I wonder, legitimacy with regards to what? So if it is a legitimacy of any political figure or system that challenges white supremacy, especially from the perspective of the white working class, then, or those who feel like they're privileged, they're racially privileged, right? Then it's not the political system itself that's in crisis, but a particular version of it. Um, maybe the one that Daniel Allen says is founded after the civil rights movement, or the, the one that you're saying is secured through sort of like these political fights. So um, when we want the legitimacy of an economic and political system that is Oh, and they would want the legitimacy of an economic political system that is premised upon white supremacy, right? That's the thing that they want to institute and protect. So it seems to me that the question of a crisis of legitimacy, I would like to see that fleshed out some more. The legitimacy with regards to what? Um, 
but yes, okay. And then also, I want to turn to uh, two of your um, solutions. So on page 21, you talk about ways in which to begin to think about what a challenge to um, white supremacy in the register of this, you know, sort of um, crisis of legitimacy. So you talk about self-determination on page 21. Um, after you talk about the tuna. So you write, the tuna of the combined black slave worker has in its synthesis a political demand for self-determination. The combined status of slave and worker still provides an, an extremely antagonistic site for blacks in the U.S. due to continued arbitrary violence from the state and white civil society as well as continued racialized economic subordination and exploitation. Consequently, it is still a case that the black demand for freedom to choose their path from domination, exploitation, and arbitrary violence is still justified in this post-civil rights era. So it seems to me that a kind of self-determination seems like a way that one might begin to push against these um, systems that are interlinked with each other. And then you also talk about uh, historical solutions, right, on page 22. Um, you write, the problem now is the timing of the historical solution. The contradictions that underlie the current crisis have their own specific aspects, but due to progressive and black movements, remain relatively weak reactionary movements could also decisively win in these, uh, these times. So there's a way in which it's sort of like the historical circumstances that we are in and seeing what forces kind of went out, right? Um, so I want to ask you about that and what, where is, what's the role of the political here? So I think I'm harkening back to some of the things that Ashley said. Um, yeah, what is the role in the political? And how does self-determination sort of figure into your idea or understanding of how the political might be a way to um, erect a kind of crisis of legitimacy that would actually lead to the kind of challenge of white supremacy and um, in subvert a capitalist order that um, is sort of oppressing and producing problems for a wide array of people. Thank you. <laughs> I can try. <laughs> so I'll try to keep this short as short and um, for lots of reasons, but mainly so that we can have a larger discussion. I think what Ashley and Anthony are both pointing to are some slippages um, in the language that both Fra that Fraser and Hopper might use on one hand, but that then I appropriate uh, in the paper. And well, I think part of what I'm going to have to do is break apart the, the, co the concept of crisis and, and, and legitimacy. And part of the reason is I think they work differently among blacks and whites and from each other. So let me start with crisis. Uh, I think on a superficial level that I'm willing to stick to for now, I can always make the excuse, that, which is true, that this is work as in the beginning of the <laughs> The superficial sounds relatively good to me right now. Um, is that for certain sectors of white Americans who have been um, privileged in the past, um, what we used to call a few decades ago the aristocracy of labor, or some, 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 some components of the petty bourgeoisie or middle class that had been relatively privileged within this system of class compromise that Jeff Ely and the historian and others, many others have, talk, have described. For them, I think the sort of traditional Habermasian concept of legitimation crisis works um, in the sense that as Frazier expounds on the, on, on the concept in her paper, the system is no longer, the state can no longer meet the demands of people that, whose demands used to be met, at least on some level, uh, by the state, let's say since the New Deal in the United States. Um, through the great society, um, and that where I complicated, I think, productively is by talking about it, not just the, pre the economic precarity that these groups 
it are experiencing as part of the legitimacy crisis and for them <coughs> that's being caused uh, through this turmoil, but also the undermining of certain expectations about a white supremacist order that they feel has been undermined by everything from affirmative action to the election of Barack Obama, no matter how symbolic the rest of us may feel some of those things are. <laughs> uh, it gets much more complicated though when, we, when, I, when uh, trying to consider so Ashley's concerns, and I think Ainsley at the end was pushing me in the same direction, and thinking about what's the status for black Americans. And I would say there is something new about the crisis in many particularly poor black communities, and I would say that's particularly true until we think about from the standpoint of the economy, which is one of the points that Megan Francis and I push in an article that's coming out in January on neoliberalism and black politics is that what the new Jim Crow sort of glosses over is the economic changes and relationship between blacks and the labor market that have occurred since the end of the civil rights era. And in particular, where you can say that a central part of a white supremacy, the interest locking of white supremacy and capitalism during slavery was extraction, expropriation of black labor through, through, through the practice of slavery. Through in the Jim Crow era, it was through the super exploitation, the way that Jane Bond Rocks and other black radical theorists have well described um, what we find now in the neoliberal era is a disposability of black work, a, di a distance from the uh, labor market. Uh, Sudor Venkatesh was a graduate student here before he became a prominent sociologist, did his field work in the Robert Taylor Homes, which was the most massive set of public housing in the United States. He said that in yeah, 1970, the unemployment rate in Robert Taylor Homes was something, was 10%, which is by classical definition a depression. Uh, by 1980, the, the unemployment rate was 25%, which in most cases would cause a proletarian revolution. Uh, by 1990, the labor force participation rate was 4%. There was a total disconnection of the community from the labor market, from labor markets, and from work, at least paid work, um, because there's other, one of his more recent books about how people hustle to provide. You still have people, they still have to get material resources but it's not connected to labor markets in any type of systematic way. And that is a radical difference when we look at communities like Baltimore or Ferguson or the south and west sides of Chicago or Los Angeles, between relationship between race and capital that we don't understand fully. So there is a new crisis, but what, what, is there a legitimacy crisis in those communities? That's much more questionable, and I would agree with that, because <clears throat> while there might be a legitimacy crisis among certain sectors of the black middle class, and we see, like, we saw this when we look at public opinion data after the Rodney King incident, we've seen it more in the more recent, where, the, where to some degree, to use a uh, phrase I think we used at some point, the black middle class will, every chance it gets, drink the Kool-Aid. Dr. King talks about this all the time. Yes, we're finally over the hump. There will finally be equality. We'll finally be full citizens. There's something that sort of disrupts that view. There might be a legitimacy crisis among some classes of African Americans. But among poor blacks, uh, even though there's support for Barack Obama, there was never a question that things are really getting better. And, uh, and the public opinion data is very clear about that. So this is all to say that I think Ashley's absolutely right, is that I have to pull apart both the concept of crisis and legitimacy. They might be connected for some sectors in the American population. Um, but both the nature of the crisis and the nature of what crisis there might be with legitimacy differs by both race and class in complicated ways that I have not figured out. In terms of where the political is, and then I'll stop. Um, I was reluctant to use the term self-determination, um, although it's been one of my favorite political demands since I was a young activist, um, because it seems like such an old 20th century, and we have all this term, and all these uh, really smart people like David Scott uh, have consigned the term and others to the realm of black romanticism and you said we live in a period of tragedy, we can't think like that anymore. But when I look at the underlying systematic op uh, oppression of particularly poor black communities and the uh, clear racial domination, it still seems to demand that uh, people who are racially oppressed should have the ability to choose how to get out from that, do do from that domination and figure their own political path. That's still self-determination. Uh, there is a very, very bad, but very common conflation of secession with self-determination. That's not what I mean. I mean the ability to choose your own political future. And that's the class thing, I think, the way that historically African Americans have understood the concept of self-determination. What that means is going to be worked out in practice by people on the ground. But I still think it's a legitimate demand as long as you have a system of racialized domination affecting um, people who are marked as the other. <coughs> 
um, how, in terms of where we are, in terms, I mean, I don't want, I mean, part of what you're talking about in terms of the historical, it was, was in response to some questions I got from readers on the question of conjuncture, what's special about this time. And I cut all the Alster stuff out of this presentation. Mm -hmm. But I do think there's something special about the time you live in. I mean, there's both potential, but the rise of Trump and the continued uh, strength of Trump and um, Carson lead me to think of the of the of 1920s Weimar as a reasonable uh, comparison, only in the sense that there is equal potential for a populist right or a populist left, mm -hmm. and a, a racialized right um, that could be quite uh, that is quite nasty and quite violent already. Um, and so I don't think there's any theological happy ending. I think people have to work for whatever progressive outcome or achieved of any. Well, by vote to have a nice short presentation, Ainsley couldn't find anything to disagree with. So let me turn it over to you. For the papers. Um, so I have a question specifically, and I want to start it off with the opening quote from Mills's uh, racial contract, which is what made me keep reading the book because I was like, this is amazing, I need to know more. Um, which was, white supremacy is the unnamed political system that has made the modern world what it is today, right? And then so we kind of get like an echoing of that in Dawson's paper here, where he says on page 15, Note that within the U.S., important sources of current crisis within the capitalist order have an intersectional aspect. The challenging of white and male privilege through decades of mobilization and social struggle has undermined part of what many in the dominant status groups, as opposed to dominant classes, felt was a commitment guaranteed by the state to maintain their privilege and implicit return for their support of capitalism. Right? So we got another piece of it in of uh, um, this essay uh, that says, "Yet today." We have a possible opening. The economic crisis that deepened the chasm between the 1% and the rest also offers an opportunity to build a transracial coalition of the disadvantaged, a new movement that understands the link between American capitalism and American racism. And so I want to know specifically if we can tie these two things together and begin with this conversation that white supremacy is the unnamed political system that has made the world what it is today. How do we then understand the, the, the issue of legitimation? Is it white supremacy that is having now issues with being legitimized? Does it need to be legitimized? Is it capitalism? Is it both? Are they dependent upon one another? So what right now is under threat and what are the implications for the other kind of equally <coughs> ominous monster in this equation? Well, the legitimation crisis was um, Michael's line of argument, so it is right. address that one. <laughs> 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 um, yes, yes, and yes, I'm not being facetious. It, um, I think there is a potential for legitimation crisis with respect to capitalism. Um, more, it's, it's, capitalism is working less and less for more and more people, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. Um, there is certainly uh, crises that <coughs> are being politically organized around in communities of color, um, specifically in this case, black communities. Um, I think part of what I say in the paper, in which I do think this logic is useful, um, that a crisis in one sense can very definitely affect positively or negatively uh, crisis in others. So, undermining the, is, is one of the oldest tricks. Um, going back to the 19th century labor movement was, or in the 1920s or 1930s or 1940s, uh, whenever, for example, in the South, labor start to organize, all of a sudden, oh, why are you organizing with some niggas? You know, so race can be, you know, one of the ways to forestall a, a capitalist crisis is to by re, by in evoking uh, racist logics as a part of white supremacy. But at the same time, when everything's being undermined, it's harder to do that. But it, the question really does become a political one of who's organizing the best, who's, getting, who's being most persuasive, who is doing the work to show why this, you know, moving this direction is more advantageous than moving in another direction. It's okay, I'll do it. We have a question over here. 
me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, um, awesome. Um, thank you both for your talks, though. Um, my question is more sort of directed to Professor Dawson. Um, one of the great things I like about your paper and, and your work generally is that you usually have this sort of like great catalog of sort of like 60s, 70s um, black movements and sort of you always are attentive to the diversity sort of like within those movements. But then as we move towards, I noticed in this paper, towards the contemporary, like hashtag Black Lives Matter tends to be this kind of nebulous, shadowy um, political entity. And I'm wondering if you at all think in terms of strategy and moving forward, it would be important to um, maybe more closely differentiate between like the hashtag and then we have like sort of like the rallying cry and then also um, sort of capital Black Lives Matter, the actual organization. Yeah. Um, I, I would say yes. Um, and um, part, of, I mean, part of what this work is, is attached to is a project Excuse me, a project that is relatively young but also relatively large on studying race and capitalism in the, in the United States across the market, you know, several different organizations and, and institutions. And one of the things that I know that I am very weak on, and I think that in general political science is exploring what's going on on the ground and understanding the movements and the type of death that um, that. Uh, I mean, I mean the type of depth that, for example, some of us might understand, like somebody like Robert Kelly understands the movements of the 20th of the 20th century, and the easy and cheap and wrong answer would be to say, well, you know, Kelly and Dawson were activists back then, so they know what was going on back then. No, we did hard work. I mean, I didn't know what the movement looked like when I was 19. I was part of a small small group in a very small city in California. So I had no idea what was going on in Maui, New Jersey, <laughs> Jersey, or Tupelo, Mississippi. That was the work of years as a scholar, to, to try to understand that and the work of other scholars, scholars, and we need to be doing the same type of work today. That works at the very beginning. And so uh, I think that's one of the weakest aspects of my work right now. But, and I think that's one of the things we want as part of this project uh, is to pay as much attention, to, in fact, I would argue in some way, well, as much attention to what's actually going on ground in politics and the economy and communities as like, theoretical work. Yes, thank you all for your presentations and for the responses. Uh, Professor Mills, uh, thank you. Uh, you talked a lot about the possibility and perhaps the necessity of a transracial coalition for achieving genuine justice and for creating this new contract. Uh, you also talked about this cannot be attained by a straight economic appeal. We have to deal with questions of identity. Uh, you also talked about intersectionality. Yes, 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 I completely agree. And so much of the discourse um, recently has, here in the United States, has been so very domestic, which is so important, so much is happening here. But I'd like to hear your ideas about the potentiality of just taking this to a global discussion these same ideas, these same notions. We often refer to colonialism and what colonial brought in terms of you know, the, the situation that we do have here. But I also want to talk about the possibility of this global uh, discourse that is possible. And I would just love to hear your ideas in terms of for addressing the, the issues nationally and also for addressing the vast inequalities globally. Well, as a third world guy, I mean, I'm all for that. I know. So, <laughs> I want to hear it. I mean, we're here talking about the states, so I think, well, I'll, I'll do my sort of US focus thing. But certainly, um, in philosophy, there is a large literature on global justice. And from my perspective, a lot of it is problematic because it makes global justice primarily a matter of distribution. And, you know, you have sort of you know, different sets of uh, this cosmopolitanism, rawlsonism, adequacy theory, which one will work best. And um, if, if, like myself, you're from a country, Jamaica, utterly shaped by imperialism and racial domination, the original indigenous people, the Taino people, were killed by the Spanish. The Spanish were then driven out by the British, who had 200 years of British colonialism. So part of the shock for me, leaving that background, and going, um, I, did, I did my PhD in Canada University of Toronto, 
was encountering a political philosophy so utterly oblivious yes. to this sort of history of racism and imperialism and sort of wandering Jesus. Did I take a wrong turn? Was I sort of misled or something? Um, I'm so worried that the name. <laughs> so um, my position has been, uh, if you'll forgive a brief plug, I guess you will, um, I have a piece um, race and Global Justice. Yeah. It's unfortunately one of those hugely expensive Rutledge monograph, uh, not monograph, because it's an essay collection, it's like $140, so even with a book grant, uh, I think professors would balk at buying it. But it's like, um, what's the title? Um, is this the Africana? I'm sorry? Is this in the Africana collection? No. No, this is, um, Rutledge have these, these books, and um, it's like something, Global Domination, Global... Actually, John, John is at the back. Is it John here? Okay, because John has a piece. I guess he's gone, yeah. Anyway, so I, my, the argument I give there is that the global justice literature needs to start taking serious the history of colonialism and imperialism. And if they do, they'll recognize that racial injustice has been <coughs> central, not merely nationally, but globally. And that you can then make a case for corrective <coughs> justice. That's part of the problem is um, I don't know to what extent you're familiar with justice literature in the States, but it's been sort of, in certain respects, perniciously influenced by the work of John Rawls, who basically says we should sort of focus on idea theory as a preferred move moving to non-idea theory, but the move never took place. And most white political class are quite happy to stay away from idea theory, because that way you can get to avoid dealing with this, like, you know, race and colonialism and so forth. And he resisted to. I'm sorry? They resisted to moving. Oh, abs absolutely resistant, yes, yes. So I argue there that um, we need to sort of make, correct, make corrective justice sort of central, and that um, you can make a case that, um, because within, um, within normative theory, um, things like charity, um, things like sort of charity, that's not your duty unless you have a certain kind of moral theory that's seen as a stupid derogatory that's above and beyond the call of duty. Whereas corrective justice is supposed to be binding on liberals across the spectrum, even on the political right, insofar as people's basic rights and liberties have been violated, rights and liberties that would be recognizable even by someone like John Locke. So my argument has been that we need to sort of make this whole <coughs> issue of colonialism, imperialism, and racism much more central. And you know, if you think of the history, think of Haiti, and Haiti having to sort of indemnify the French, the loss of their property. If you think of you know, the great crimes of imperialism, uh, Bel you know, the Belgian Congo and so forth, there's obviously you know, a lot of material there. But all of it gets covered up in the, in the global justice literature because of this focus on ideas and sort of ignoring of the past. So I think that, um, you know, going back to the, the sentence quoted from the beginning of the book, I think you, know, you can make a case that given the sort of um, deep implication of white supremacy you know, within modern world order, then a case for corrective justice can be made on those grounds, yes. Thank you. I'm sure you had a lot to say about the recent uh, visit. Um, David Cameron. Cameron. <laughs> David Cameron. <laughs> right, with um, Portia, or my Prime Minister, upgrading him, you know, where's the money? Well, give us some money for prisons, but this reparation stuff, no. Thank you. Yes, um, <clears throat> thank you for your excellent presentations and for the respondents. I think that helped to enlighten and pick through some of uh, some central points. Um, Professor Dyson, um, do you think that not as a movement, but Black Lives Matter as a rhetorical disruptor has contributed to, at least given the perception of contributing to the delegitimization of the capitalist social order? And the second part uh, for Professor Mills, um, I think your racial contract is outstanding. And it kind of parallels the work of Joe Fagan with his white racial frame. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yes. OK. Um, so how can the ideas presented in both your book and his and his work uh, contribute towards um, a deeper understanding of an identity crisis that uh, many white people, many people who call themselves or believe themselves to be white, as Ta-Nehisi Coates would say today, how, how can that give them some guidance as to how can they move forward and stabilize their identity around justice? 
Being, I would say that the slogan Black Lives Matter has helped to bring the issue of the illegitimacy of the racial order forward. Uh, I think some local work done in St. Louis, Baltimore, and elsewhere mm -hmm. um, has, crossed, has also shined a light on the illegitimacy of a, a certain practices of racial lives capitalism as well. But I don't think, I think there needs to be a stronger effort to link more explicitly capitalism as an entity to the, to, to, uh, the racial order as well in, in um, the work, but you know, what little work we do here and the hard work that people do on the ground. Yes, um, I know um, Fagan's book, for he has so many, but um, I, I, I don't know that one, and I, I have quoted from it. And you can certainly see the white racial framework work in, in social contract theory, in roles in justice theory, insofar as you frame justice in such a way that racial justice as an issue never enters the picture. The question then is, you know, what is necessary to sort of break down the white racial frame? And of course, what you have to do is sort of, you know, try to show how, you know, by its sort of own logic, it's inconsistent. <coughs> once you sort of recognize the ontological, I'm taking back ontological, <laughs> once you recognize the ontological equality of all human beings, okay. and sort of say, well, you know, where are the concerns of people of color being addressed in this work? In terms of whiteness, um, if I could plug on the work of a friend, um, Linda Martin Olkoff has a book, The Future of Whiteness, and um, this is in part a kind of historical overview of how whiteness has developed and also how whiteness could develop. So there's some people who see whiteness as this identity that because of the sort of linkage of its history with oppression, he's been trying to cast it off. Whereas her position, the position of you know, various other people in philosophy is that that's unrealistic and uh, racialized society. You can't cast off whiteness. It's a kind of gestural but not meaning anything. And what you need to do is turn whiteness to progressive ends. So sort of link up with you know, that sort of subordinated part of, you know, of history to be a sort of white anti-racist activist history. So recognize that there have been whites against imperialism, against white supremacy, against Jim Crow. And then you, know, you have a sort of transformative whiteness which sort of recognizes this linkage and sort of seeks to bring about an end to a racially unfair order. So personal transformation, I mean, there's a, there are a lot, lot of stuff by white and racist activists, as you know, um, Tim Weiss and other people talking about this kind of thing. So I think, you know, we need to sort of see more of that. We need to understand that whiteness is not static, whiteness is not sort of historically fixed, whiteness sort of evolves over time, and that there's a potential, it's by no means predetermined, but there's a potential for a progressive and to racist whiteness to develop among, you know, today's whites, um, sort of young white people. But this is not something that's going to come automatically, it's not guaranteed by history. It's going to require political activism. It's going to require, um, as I say, trying to sort of, you know, make this history sort of, you know, pertinent and salient for people so that people can recognize why that particular history. Um, one, one, one of the points I, I make in the brief essay is, why is this country simultaneously the richest country in the world and the country in which there's a sort of greatest inequality of income and wealth. What has made that possible? And there's a long-standing um, you know, black argument, you can find it in people like Borden and so forth and Du Bois. Mm -hmm. It has to do with the sort of centrality of whiteness. That means that um, a working class that would have formed to sort of provide a kind of oppositional force against capital has in general, in sort of moments of sort of, you know, when sort of race and class have sort of come into play, White racial identity has trumped class identity. What am I? I'm a, I'm a white worker. I'm white. I'm white in these contexts. So it then means you don't get a national social democratic party of the strength you have in Western European countries. You don't get a strong national labor movement. So you then get a sort of capital that is sort of unrestrained. So I think, you know, that's, that's, there is a potential there, given the fact that, you know, things are no longer working, even for a large section of the white population, but this will not happen automatically. It will require people to be sort of, you know, active and, you know, form political movements and erase these issues in a, in a, in a conscious way. In that, in that regard, just quickly, um, um, 
one of the things I have problems with is this overuse of the black body, the female body, and so forth. And you talk about in the racial contract, contract the whole notion of a sub person, sure. right? And a sub person doesn't have any um, political determination. In, in politic, as you said, it, and that they have to assert their humanity, but you can't assert one's humanity as a body because we're really very complex beings. And, and I think that has really gone way too far. I mean, I, I know the feminist and womanist dimensions to that, but to constantly refer to body, 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 and not think of the whole being, the whole person, that they, the person has moral authority, not a body. Um, persons are eulogized, bodies are buried. And so we, we got to kind of keep that in mind. Thank you. Um, some questions. Uh, the uh, white supremacy of white America that you guys use, is that, that's that in relation to like several different nations that I would like to ask. It's in the case of, uh, take an example of uh, Michael Brown, the whole case of Michael Brown, uh, how he was shocked to uh, how police department fabricated uh, why he was shot in relation to maybe he saw in a, a grocery store, and two, um, uh, how uh, the uproar happens, uh, but even let's focus on that Michael Brown's case legally, but the court, how the court turned out, and how even government turned out to it. Um, if uh, white America or white supremacy that you are saying cannot hear what you are saying, well, cannot you hear the cry of the injustice? Uh, if white supremacy does not does not have, or white America does not have any ear, uh, ability, capacity to, to listen, what would you say? I'm asking uh, in relation to self determination. Uh, let's say, uh, like a state of Black America, that uh, Louis Farrakhan would say, why uh, we, uh, or I mean the they, are waiting for benevolent white people to come. Am I making sense to yeah. the question? Um, I mean, that question has been one that's been hotly debated among in the black movement since the 19th probably the 18th <laughs> Goes back a long way. Uh, century, and one where I don't think there's a resolution, but it certainly may uh, divide. But the, the answer I would give is that black movements have never and should never uh, rely on white or anybody else's benevolence, and that if people may not want to hear, but it's the duty of political mobilization and movements to demand that they are heard. Uh, and that's whether we're talking about the civil rights movement, um, the movements that occurred uh, in the early 20th century among black Americans. Um, Charles evoked um, Cyril Briggs's African Blood Brotherhood, Hubert Harrison with somebody else, and his Liberty League. There's, there's uh, Barbie's uh, UNIA, or from uh, more recent generations, uh, um, groups from the Young Lords Party, which was a predominantly Puerto Rican revolutionary group. None of those movements were relying on benevolence, they were relying on mobilization of political power. Um, and that political power could take a variety of forms. Um, <clears throat> but I think what we have to realize that all these logics are contested whether they're patriarchal logic, white supremacist logic, <coughs> logic the capitalist logic. So, and the, and the, the, act, the, the art of politics is to win people over to your position, to mobilize enough power, to be able to enforce demands that a movement makes, whether that demands for self-determination or not. Thank you very much for your talks. In, in both of your papers, the question of equality and the question of justice 
is kind of there as an analytic, but it's also there as a kind of unit of commensuration. And I'm just curious about whether that unit of commensuration exists in a kind of non-racialized space-time, where there is no, for instance, hierarchizing of it before it even enters into the frame, um, creating the questions that you know, creating the kinds of issues that, that somebody like Fanon, for instance, pointed out, that you, know, you, you have this inevitability of a kind of racialized discourse, even if you don't have a white body in sight under certain types of conditions. I don't know if that's, if that's... So the question is more, what's the unit of commensuration for that concept of justice or equality outside of a racialized space? That's sort of for me. Um, OK. Okay, um, to the dismay of many people, I know, I'm trying to work within a liberal framework, I know, I know. <laughs> 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 people cross the street. What happens to the best people? <laughs> <laughs> There's a bunch of people on cross the street when they see me coming. Anyway, so, um, so the idea is, um, as I said on um, my brief presentation, liberalism has been racialized. But racial injustice is inconsistent with a non-racialized liberal theory. So my argument has been that insofar as liberalism has always been the dominant political force in the United States, demands for racial justice um, would be more efficacious to sort of work within that framework. And you know, it has not actually been done, as I said, with the mainstream political philosophy. But you know, that just means that um, we need to sort of take a different tack. I mean, in my work, I've been trying to sort of develop a critique of the roles and way of doing social justice and saying that there's a different and superior way of doing it. But it's still within a liberal framework, and the liberal framework is then supposed to provide a sort of overarching and sort of commensurable sort of set of values and norms, given that this is sort of a dominant political philosophy in the United States historically. And you know, in this broad sense, of course, when I say liberal, I mean in the broad circles that includes liberals, liberals on the left and on the right. So the idea is that you're appealing to Americans for who are in theory supposed to be liberals, and you're saying if you're a good liberal, you should be supporting racial justice. So going back to my question, it's not a matter of charity, it's a matter of justice. The situation of you know, blacks, of Native Americans, Latinos, this is an injustice, supposed to be a violation the principle of liberal theory, which is not seen as such, you know, we still get a discourse of you know, multiculturalism and diversity. It's not seen as such because of the way liberalism has developed. So you, know, you basically need to sort of turn liberalism in a different direction. So the example I'm following here is a sort of you know, feminist liberal approach, which says liberalism in principle, you know, um, has some good stuff there, but liberal principles don't um, extend across the sort of private, private public line. It's been a liberal that's been patriarchal, so we need a non patriarchal liberal theory. So I'm sort of following that example in the case of race. Okay. Thank you so much for, for such a stimulating uh, um, conversation. Um, it seems to me that in iconographic terms, I can say that this. Uh, uh, proposal or, or idea about a trans class and transracial encounter could be perhaps uh, uh, condensed in the encounter between Black Lives Matter and Bernie Sanders. Uh, that kind of like comparisons uh, of, of the, the, the demand for racial justice in front of the um, uh, leader of, 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 a, of a socialist position. So I, I was wondering if you actually could offer some reflections about this, because uh, I can't help keep pinching myself about hearing the word socialism circulating <laughs> in society. <laughs> Having Hillary Clinton say, calling herself a progressive, uh, with whatever, I'm, I'm not concerned with the truth of the, of the statement, <laughs> as, much as, <laughs> as much as with the reconfiguration yeah. of language mm -hmm. within uh, this current political scenario. And of course, the question of gender that also comes in the present. So you know, we have Black Lives Matter, Bernie Sanders. That is not, uh, it's not your. your uh, it's, it's a kind of whiteness that is a, a very ethnically inflected. No one is talking about his Jewishness, strangely so. Uh, and then gender. So it's I, I'm puzzled by this, and I just wonder if you could offer some reflections. Well, um, if anybody had told me that a self-described socialist would still be pulling those kinds of crowds and getting that kind of money months after he started the campaign, I thought you were utterly crazy. And this 
then this whole thing will sort of fall flat within two or three weeks. So that goes to show how good a sort of political prognosticator I am. <laughs> so, so I think maybe it's an indication of the times, going back to what Michael and he's talking about legitimation crisis, but certainly these are not the normal kinds of, kinds of sort of circumstances you know, to have him. It's an indication, I think, of the sort of deep extent to which um, even for white Americans, you know, there are these sort of very really deep problems, the sort of, you know, um, one percent versus the rest, you know, sort of um, drying up of pensions, you know, kids moving back home, stuff I mentioned briefly in the article. That's why I think the potential is there for a movement that's going to say this system's not working, even for many white people. So a um, simple way of encapsulating my land is basically social democracy plus racial justice. Um, and I sort of have them as separate because social democracy started in this country, though it pretends to universalism, has not really included racial justice, sort of classic case being, of course, the New Deal under Roosevelt, where you have, for example, you know, crucial um, um, things being written in such a way that agricultural workers and um, domestic workers are excluded, which is precisely where blacks were most sort of rep 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 represented. So you have to sort of recognize that the seemingly un universalism of, of a sort of left liberal policy that the white left push and says, well, this, this is not going to be divisive, it's going to solve by addressing the poor in general, doesn't work insofar as the situation of blacks and Latinos is not just a matter of you know, a class disadvantage, but a specific kind of racial disadvantage that's going to involve things like um, not having the same access to mortgages, um, segregation, both residential and educational, so that in these particular facts, and of course, both the criminal justice system, that's why you need corrective racial justice as a separate component within it. You can't just assume that a sort of standard left liberal project will succeed, given the ways in which sort of left liberalism historically has been racialized in this country. I would mostly agree with that, and I'll one thing we all agree about is the pessimistic side, which is we have Sanders and Trump is not going away either, and neither is Carson. Um, so we are at a potentially, and these words I haven't used in decades, you know, revolutionary time, but revolution will be on the left or the right. Um, and that makes it a time of great potential and great danger. Um, I guess in terms of the transracial movements, I want us to remain flexible. I, I want there to be space for um, Latino or black-centered movements to grow. I want um, there to be space for multiracial organizations and movements to grow. I think the time, I think what we'll, we'll see is, and what we saw, certainly saw in the past, is that there, are, that there is room for a variety of different types of progressive movements side by side that can play different roles. Some people feel more comfortable in, for example, what in the early <coughs> second wave feminist period for women caucuses. Uh, those, those, I would argue, those need for those type of spaces have not disappeared. Um, the need for those type of spaces have not disappeared for, for many racial groups. So we need to be building movements that are both multiracial and be at the same time comfortable with racially centric movements as well. And I could just briefly sort of say, when I said transracial, I didn't mean that each individual movement was transracial, but I meant on a sort of macro national scale. I trans understand that, trans but, but that you sense. think you've worked with people who believe that yes. they all have to belong yes. to the same organization. Okay, sure, sure, sure. And that's not going to happen, sure. and it shouldn't happen for that matter. So we have unfortunately ran out of time. Mm -hmm. And you join me at that.